please bow your heads. Father, thank you again for your goodness uh, that we sang about this morning. And it's so easy to overlook or forget, and yet you pour it out. It is poured out on us. And may we see that, Father, and, and uh, respond appropriately and offer ourselves to you just as you gave yourself for us. Speak to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, when I was a kid, for most of my childhood, I shared a room with my older brother. He's five years older than me. And he was a very neat guy. He still is, which I'm not. So he kind of, being the older one and the neat one, had kind of control of the room. And on the wall, there was four pictures on this one wall. And three of them, I have no idea what they were. But there's one that I can't forget. In fact, I remember the day that he got the picture. He had to go to a a department store to get it, to meet the person uh, whose picture it was. And I remember I went, I have four sisters too, but they weren't there that day for whatever reason. So my mom took my brother, he may have been about 12 or 13 or so, to, uh, to this place to meet this guy. And so we dropped him off. He was old enough to be by himself, but I wasn't, or he didn't want me hanging around. So I went with my mom. And we drop him off where he's supposed to meet the guy, and we go to the elevator and waiting for the elevator to open. And it opens. And who is standing there but the guy who my brother was going to see. And he looks down at me and he says, how you doing, champ? And then he just walks on. And I don't know if I responded or not, but I was about this tall, but I felt like this tall. Because he was a famous athlete. He was the quarterback of the Green Bay Packers. At that time, like today, the best team there is. (laughs) But here's this guy, this famous guy who acknowledged a little kid. I met him for about 30 seconds, and I remember it to this day. 30 seconds, and yet it... It sticks with me. I know that picture exactly that my brother had because it was signed by Bart Starr, a famous quarterback back who said hi to me, a five or six year old kid. Now we're about to go into a series about meeting Jesus. And the reason is that everybody who met Jesus was changed. Everybody. You either got better or you got worse. The more you met him, the more you changed. So why are we going to do that? Why do we want to look at these interchanges Jesus had with other people? Well, it's not really rocket science. We want to learn about our own experience with Jesus through the experience these people had. Because I assume that's why you're here. That you came here to meet Jesus. I know you didn't come to meet me or somebody else here. That would be, thank you, Barb, but compared to meeting Jesus, it's not even close. Maybe we didn't even realize that's why we came, but there's a hunger and a desire in each one of us that only he can satisfy. So we want to meet him. Now, we're going to work backwards. We're going to start at the end of Jesus' life and move towards Christmas. So the one we're going to look at today is from the last chapter of John. Now, Jesus, we're going to learn this one thing about Jesus today is that Jesus restores And to restore means to bring something back to its original state or to um, make it as it was. Now, uh, some people restore cars. Some people restore furniture. People restore pieces of land. But Jesus wants to restore everything. He wants to restore the whole universe. It all belongs to him, but it's lost. It's lost. It got separated from him, and he's going to bring it back. He's not blowing it off saying, I'll just create a new universe, which he could do. He said, that's mine. I want it back. And he is restoring the whole universe, including each one of us. Now, before we read John 21, we have to set the stage a little bit. So this is what has happened. Jesus has 12 intimate followers that travel with him for three years. And he begins to tell them about midway or so that he is going to Um, be turned over to their enemies, the religious leaders, that they're going to arrest him, they're going to beat him, and then the invading force that occupies their country, they're going to kill him. Now, the disciples really do not understand this, and we know this because what they're talking about is which one of them is the greatest, which one of them is going to have their throne closest to Jesus' throne. That's what they're talking about. They're not talking about 
Jesus is going to die. What are we going to do? That's, they don't get it at all. So the night before Jesus dies, and he knows it's the last night, they don't. He, the king, does something very unusual for a king. He takes off his clothes and he gets down on his knees and he washes the feet of his servants. He sets an example for them. And then he comforts them. He assures them, hey, don't worry. God is with you. Just as I've been with you, God will always be with you. And then he says something that kind of throws them for a loop. He says, you're all going to abandon me, all of you. You're all going to abandon me and, and leave me alone. And Peter, the head of this group of 12, says, you know what, Jesus, these other 11 guys, they might abandon you, but I never will. I would die for you. And Jesus said, Peter, you're going to abandon me. You're going to betray me worse than anybody else. Because when I need you the most, you're going to deny that you even know me. You're going to pretend that you've never even met me. And a rooster will crow as soon as that happens. And that's what Jesus said is exactly what happens. Now, Peter was not a coward. He meant what he said. When they come to arrest Jesus that night, he pulls out a sword, and he's ready to fight, and he cut off a guy's ear. Now, I doubt he was aiming for the ear. Why would you cut off somebody's ear, right? I'm I'm pretty sure he wanted to split this guy's head open, but in mercy, he had bad aim. He was a fisherman. He wasn't a soldier. And Jesus said, don't do that. Stop. And when he sees that Jesus is not willing to fight, that he gets arrested, Peter and all the rest run away. But Peter, he stays close. He follows Jesus where he goes. And so Jesus is taken to the, the, um, the house of the high priest. And Peter follows him there. He's in the courtyard with all these other people. It's a big night. A lot is going on. People, it's, stuff is happening. And Peter's among that crowd. And three times people say, hey, you know this. Jesus. You're one of his followers, aren't you? And three times he denies it. The third time, the rooster crows, and it says that they were within view of one another. It says Jesus looked at Peter, that their eyes met. Not a word was exchanged. And Peter broke down and he cried. He ran away and he wept. So this uh, leads us to John 21. Jesus, two days later, he has died, but he's risen again. And the first lady that comes to the tomb, he, he says, go tell my disciples I'm, I'm going to meet you. And he says, tell Peter. He specifically points out Peter. Now this, when Peter hears this, he runs to the tomb to look. Why? Because he thought the last thing he ever said to Jesus was to deny him. He thought he was dead. He did not believe or understand that he would come back to life. He thought his last exchange with this guy he loved was to deny him. And he's alive now. And this chapter 21 of John is Jesus restoring Peter specifically. So let's read it. John 21, verse 1, says, After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan, Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. So the first thing we see in the way that Jesus restores, he wants to restore everything and everybody, but the first thing we see is that he does this by demonstrating his power. So the, the, these guys are fishing all night. These are fishermen. By their own power, how many fish did they catch? Zero, not one. Jesus comes along, and 10 seconds later, they've got all the fish they can possibly handle. All of it. And they can't handle it anymore. Now, Jesus reveals himself through his power. He came to earth and he said, I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. I'm the person that you've been waiting for, the Jewish people. I'm the one that's going to restore all of creation to God. 
He didn't just say it. He backed it up with power. He did things only God could do. He healed an untold number of people. He fed huge crowds of people more than once with just a little boy's lunch. More than once he did that. He brought back to life people that were loved by their family. A widow, her only son, all she had in the world, he brought him back to life. He did miraculous things only God could do to prove who he was. But he didn't just prove it by the power behind those things. He proved the power of his character, who he was, what kind of person he was. All of his miracles were for the good of other people. He blessed other people with that power. There's only two incidents where he used his power for destructive purposes, and, and we don't have time to look at them this morning, but I think that shows tremendous restraint, don't you? That he had all this power and always used it for good and only twice did destructive things. Because that wouldn't be the case if you and I had that power, right? We're driving down the road, and some guy decides to cut us off, right? Unjustified. Well, he can think about it on the side of the road. Well, he fixes the flat tire we just gave him, right? I mean, <laughs> this would happen. We would abuse our power if we had it. Jesus did not do that. He, he never, there's no instance of him using that power for his own benefit, his own good. He was... God with all this tremendous power, but he was God not because he had the power, but because of how he used that power. And he's trying to, remember this story is about restoring Peter, and he's not trying to intimidate him. He's trying to connect with him. He doesn't use coercion. Now we just went through a presidential election, right? And both sides give us half-truths. They don't tell us the whole truth. They want to they want us to think the way they want us to think. And many times it works. I'm sorry to say, but the general public, we are stupid. We believe half-truths. We hear a little snippet. We take it as the truth without knowing for real if that's the case. But Jesus doesn't want to do that. He's not trying to coerce or force anybody to do anything. He's trying to inform, let us make our own decision but he wants us to see how he really is. Now, have you experienced God's grace? In other words, have you received something good from God when you know you didn't deserve it? And there was one Christmas, I had become a Christian when I was in high school, and uh, then I left, I left the church. I didn't go back to doing all the, the bad things I'd done, but I'd run away from God. I knew it was wrong, but um, I did it nevertheless. <clears throat> And um, my family went to uh, church, <clears throat> a Christmas Eve service, and I didn't really want to go, but I really did it to um, make my mom happy and stuff. And I mean, my heart, it was kind of hard against God for no reason. I mean, I had, I thought reasons, but no real good reason. But I get to church, and the music plays, and we're singing these worship songs, and it reminded me of the goodness of God, the good things God had done for me. And I didn't go there with that intention, but <clears throat> I ended up bawling like a baby, right? Just because um, God is reaching out to me. I've turned my back on him, basically. And God's ministering to me, reminding me of all the good things that he's done for me. God showed me his grace. And I'm sorry to say that didn't, was not the turnaround. <clears throat> I did not come back to God at that moment. But God poured out his grace on me in such a way that uh, I knew, I knew the goodness of God at that time. Let's continue reading in verse 7. It says, That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came into the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but a, about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. 
Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So the second way we see that Jesus restores is in love. Now, no, at no point, remember, this story is about Jesus restoring Peter. At no point up to this point, and no point beyond this, as we read, does Jesus mention Peter's betrayal. Why is that? Is it possible that Jesus has forgotten? No, he is not. It's because it wasn't necessary. Peter was sorry for his sin. He went out and wept. Bitterly, it says, he knew he had done wrong and he had regretted it. That's what God is looking for. He's looking for a repentant heart. There was a time where <clears throat> our children came uh, to my wife and I. They wanted to meet with us, so we met with them. And they, they wanted to meet with us so they could confess a sin, is what it was. And it was a serious sin. Um, but, I mean, our kids are human. We're not expecting them to be perfect. Uh, they're close, but they're not perfect. <laughs> they have a good mother, that's why. But So, I mean, of course you're disappointed that they were engaged in this, but they came to us. Quite honestly, if they had said nothing, we wouldn't have known, except I do believe this. If you're a Christian, God's going to expose your sin. It may not be today, but it's going to be tomorrow at some point. Christians cannot hide. Now, you can expose it yourself, which is a better thing to do. But if you don't, God will expose it for you, and that's much worse. But anyway, they came to us and told us about it, and they were repentant. They were sad. They regretted it. So what did my wife and I do? Of course, we lectured them and told them not to do that. No, we didn't do that. We didn't need to. They were already repentant. That's all we could ask for. We just loved them. We didn't have to scold them. We didn't have to bring it up. Why? They did it, they confessed, they repented. Uh, and Jesus, that's what he's looking for from us. He didn't need to bring it up with Peter. He knew that Peter was already sorry for what he had done. He's not trying to rub salt in an open wound. He wants to heal that wound, not make it worse. So what does he do? He makes them breakfast. Their first interaction is he makes them breakfast, fish and bread. Now, this would not have been the first time he had made that meal for them. Remember, he fed the thousands of people he fed them fish and bread more than once. There was leftovers. Jesus provided that food. So this was a familiar meal that they've eaten with Jesus before. But in order to really understand this story, we have to go back to the beginning. See, in Luke 5, it tells us about when Jesus first called these fishermen. It says Jesus was walking along. A crowd is following him, and he's by the lake. And there's two sets of brothers on the edge of the lake. There's Peter and Andrew and James and John. These are fishermen, they're partners in a business, said they had been out fishing all night and caught nothing, and now they're on the shore washing their nets. And Jesus says, Peter, can I go in your boat so I can speak to these people? It probably would create a barrier from the people and allow his voice to project. And Peter says, okay. Jesus teaches the people, and when he's done, he says to the fishermen, go out into the deep water and cast your nets. And Peter said, you know, we just came back from all night. All night we did this and caught nothing. But he's just heard Jesus teach. He's seen this crowd following him. He knows this is no ordinary guy. He says, okay, because you say we'll do it. And they go out and fish. It says they catch so many that their nets break. Remember it said here that their nets didn't break. But that time their nets do break. Because they're so full of fish. And when Jesus, or Peter, sees what Jesus has done, it says he falls on his feet before him and says, go away from me, I'm a sinful man. And Jesus is not surprised at that. He knew exactly who he was calling. He said, come, you're going to follow me now. You're going to fish for men. So they're going to think of that story when Jesus called them. And now this story, Jesus is trying to duplicate that very instant to communicate to Peter. Look, what do people... This is not a business transaction. This is between two people who love each other. What do people who love each other have in common? They have common experiences, don't they? When you get together with family and friends, don't you reminisce? Remember back when this happened? Jesus is trying to remind Peter of the relationship they have. 
And he does it by repeating this, this thing that they've experienced before. Now, this is what I think. Why did the nets break the first time? Well, Jesus is calling Peter and these other men to follow him. And I don't think Jesus is above using a little bit of manipulation. If their nets are broke, it's easier for them to say, I'll follow Jesus. Because I always think, well, if we stay fishing, we've got to fix these nets. I don't want to do that. I'll follow Jesus instead, right? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so he doesn't need for the nets to break this time, right? They already know Jesus. And when does Jesus come? He comes in the morning after a long night of work. So... Jesus is trying to connect on a personal level. We have this shared experience. In love, he's coming to them, in gentleness, in kindness. That's how he comes to you and I. Amen? Now, uh, so if you and I need restoration, and we do, we need it every day. Every day we fall short. Now, we may not commit a grievous sin every day, do something that we absolutely know is wrong, that will break Jesus' heart. But sometimes we do. But if we need that, God is waiting for us. He's ready to reconnect with us and bless us. Amen? Amen. Verse 15 says, And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So we see a third thing Jesus does when he restores people, he restores them to a high calling. Now when Peter says, I'm going fishing, he doesn't mean I'm just going to go fishing now. He means I'm going back to fishing. I'm going to become a fisherman again. He's lost his purpose. His leader is gone. Yes, Jesus has come and he's told them some things, but it's not clear to him yet what exactly lies in store. So he's going, I'm going to go back to the familiar. I'm going to do what I know to do, and that's to fish. Now, um, I guess I just got to keep my glasses on. <laughs> now, Peter had betrayed Jesus. He had betrayed him in a very serious way. But Jesus was not done with him. This failure of Peter did, just did not cast him aside. He didn't say, I'll just find somebody else, somebody new. His intention was for Peter. And Peter's sin did not change that intention. His plan for Peter didn't change. Now, uh, Jesus' plans for Peter were bigger than Peter's plans for himself. And if you remember, Pastor Jay talked to us last week, and he said something similar. Accountability is somebody wanting more for you than you want for yourself. Well, that's God for us. He has a bigger plan for us than we have for ourselves. And we may say, well, I'm not the smartest. I'm not the most talented. He knows what he's uh, getting involved with. He knows that. In fact, he loves those kind of people best. I don't think he necessarily prefers them, but they are more willing servants most often. Very talented people rely on that talent instead of God. But if you're an ordinary person called to a high calling, what choice do you have but to rely on God? And so he loves ordinary people. Um, now, I was reading, I told you I ran away from God um, and one of the reasons I did that, I was really, honestly, truly afraid. It wasn't the only reason, but I was afraid if I trusted God, he was going to tell me to go be a missionary in Africa. And I did not want to do that. And I just read in a book this week, this guy is, he's talking about Christians in general. He says he cannot tell you how many times people have told him, I didn't follow God because I was afraid he was going to make me a missionary in Africa. This is just a lie of the devil that he's going to, if you become a Christian, God's going to send you to deepest, darkest Africa. Now, I can't say he won't, but here's the thing. God, we don't understand Christianity then. God needs, he's trying to restore this world. That means he needs followers of his everywhere. Everywhere there's people, he wants a follower of his to be there too. So, 
There's nothing wrong with being a fisherman. We need fishermen. We need mechanics. We need teachers. Those are all good things. And if we are those things, we should be the best we can possibly be. Christian mechanics should be the best mechanics. Christian teachers should be the best teachers. Now, talent-wise, I was a teacher. I was, I'm not the best teacher. I'm not. Uh, in basic talent, I don't have the talent that some to you, some just take to it so naturally. I now work with teachers. I know there's a God because I help train new teachers. <laughs> and I'm not that good of a teacher. I'm just being honest with you. But I did the best I could. I, I, I tried to be the best teacher I could because I was a Christian teacher. I represent God. But there's no such thing as just a Christian teacher. And what I mean by that is all of us are real, we're secret agents, really. We are secret agents for the kingdom of God. Now, we're not working against, um, we're working for the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of God wants everybody to come in. It wants everybody to go. Every Christian is an ambassador to the world. We represent Jesus. And uh, all of us, all of us, no matter where we are, that's who we are. That's what we do. So if you're a mechanic, it's in, with this in mind that I'm a, a mechanic for the kingdom of God, and I'm looking for opportunities to bless the kingdom of God. And we'll see that as we read the last verses, verse 18. It says, truly, truly, I say to you, this is Jesus speaking, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after th saying this, he said to him, follow me. So the last way that Jesus restores is through us. So what, does he, what is he telling Peter? What's this high calling? Now the Catholics believe that Peter was the, the first pope, and in a sense that's true. He was the head of the church at the beginning. That was God's job for him. Um, but he said, what's the last thing he said to him? Is follow me. That's the last thing he said to him by the lake in Luke 5. He said, follow me. In other words, go where I go. Do what I do. I'm trying to save the world, and that's what you're going to do too. Now, it's not as though Jesus went to heaven and said, okay, you guys, do a good job. Now it's your turn to save the world. Jesus is just as involved in the world as he was before. In fact, he's more involved. When he was here physically, he was limited by those physical qualities of his. He could only be in one place at one time. That's not true of Jesus anymore. He can be everywhere at once, and he is. Now we become his hands. We become his feet. He's not sent us, a, given us a job and gone away. He's working with us every day, everywhere we go. So do we have that perspective that we are, even though whatever we might be, a mechanic, an electrician, whatever it is, that I'm really working for God and God is working with me and he will give me opportunities. He will set me up to work for his kingdom. So this week I, I met with a teacher um, I told her, just because of the, the way my flights work, she's far away from the airport. I said, I can come and see you, but we can't meet for long because the flights have changed. i got to get back. She said, that's okay. I'm not feeling good, and a, a terrible thing happened in my family. So I'm trying to be sensitive to the teachers. Um, I said, hey, would it be better to meet another day? And she didn't say no. <laughs> so I kind of took it. She's okay. So I said, I'm coming. And we get there, and we talk, and she tells me about what happened in her family. It, 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 I'm not going to tell you what happened, but it's just a bad thing, and she's kind of caught in the middle. But she's sharing this with me, and so I just felt like God wanted me to minister to her. Now, I'm in a secular job. I'm not, I, you know, I have to be careful what I do, but nevertheless, I sent her a text and said, I, you know, I, I'm not speaking to you now as your UH mentor. I'm talking to you as somebody who knows you, that my wife and I are going to pray for you and your family. And she responded. She was so grateful. And I do believe that as Christians, God puts us in positions where we can meet the needs of people as though he was there, as though he was the one doing it. We are the ones that are meant to minister. Now, do you think you know anybody that needs to be restored to God? 
Now, I, I grew up going to church. From the time I was born, I went to church. Every Sunday, we went to church. We went to church for special events. I went to a, a Catholic school. I went to church during the week. And yet, it was, I was 15 years old before I ever heard the gospel. And it wasn't in church. It was in some guy's house in Kalama Valley. Do you think that there's people you know that, that need to be restored to God? And I don't mean necessarily that they had a relationship with him and it's broken. That could be true. But everybody is born needing to be restored to God. Is there people we know that need that? Because God wants to use us to connect them. Amen? Amen. So I wanna, uh, uh, here's some pictures of what happened yesterday. Um, we were invited by somebody in this church to go lend a hand to somebody. They couldn't do it themselves. So the guys who could got together and we went. I mean, this is a way of, of ministering the gospel to people. We went and we tried to restore relationship if it was needed, right? We're about to, after service, we're going to go over to that park and we're going to share some snacks and some drinks and hopefully you can make it. The intention is to help them restore them to God. And we're not doing this on our own. We believe God is setting us up. We're doing God's work. God is arranging it so that we'll have these connections. We don't know how it's going to work out. He doesn't tell us that. He says, obey. Jesus said, cast the net over. He didn't say what was going to happen. They had to cast the net to find out. Jesus says we are to reach out to people. The results are up to God. The, the obedience is up to us. We have a Christmas service. Here's a little card that talks about that. Do you know somebody? Do you think that, that would be blessed by coming here and experiencing God that might be willing to come and experience Christmas? Most people will come at Christmas and Easter, even if they don't go to church. These are in the back. Take a few. Hand them out. Who knows what God will do? Amen? God is out to restore us first. He wants to restore us, but he also wants to restore us to the point that we become like him, that the things that we do are exactly what he would do. Now, none of us have reached that point yet, but that's the point God's trying to get us to. Amen? All right, well, let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for your goodness and, and that you have... I pray, restored each one of us to fellowship with you. And if we have fallen out, Father, if there is a sin that we need to get right with you, then I pray that we could just confess that you are ready and, and eager to forgive. Restore us, Father, to right relationship with you, just as David prayed in that psalm this morning. But I pray, Father, more than just us being restored to right relationship with you, that you would use us to help restore others, Father. People we know that may have fallen away from you, that are thinking now that you're angry with them uh, or want nothing to do with them. Father, help us to convey your love to them. Father, the people that don't know you, they don't even know that they want to know you yet. Give us wisdom and, and uh, opportunity to share the truth of you with them. We know that it's you that work on their hearts, you that minister to them. But uh, you can give a face through us to them, somebody who knows you, who can talk about you. So help us, 